Hi there, and welcome to the Tenancy Deposit Scheme's latest webinar, Tenancy Deposits and COVID-19, Minimising Risk. This webinar will be presented by Alison McDougall, who is the Director of Dispute Operations at TDS. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben McAdis. I support with the webinar operations and delivery at TDS. I have the pleasure of supporting Alison today. Um, thank you to everyone who could make it. Um, obviously, it's a, a very challenging time, so thank you for being able to make this webinar. Um, hopefully, these questions uh, will be um, fruitful for everybody and it also uh, will give you some insight from uh, TDS's perspective with regards to COVID-19. Before I hand over to Alison, I'd just like to take the opportunity to let you know a couple of features available in the webinar platform today. Firstly, feel free to ask any questions uh, that you may have. We'd love to hear from you. Um, for those on the desktop uh, computer, uh, please use the toolbar on the left-hand side of your screen under the question section. And Alison and I will review all the questions at the end of the presentation and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, secondly, um, feel free to take notes today. Uh, you can do so using the uh, icon, which is a piece of paper with a pencil in it. Um, this will vary on device to device, um, but you should be able to locate that on your screens. Um, and for the purposes uh, of this, uh, I'd like, now like to hand over to Alison, um, who will uh, present the webinar. Alison, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ben, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's T TDS uh, webinar. Thank you all for joining us uh, and hope you're all uh, keeping safe and well. Um, just to introduce myself and the topic, the topic is obviously around the topic of the moment, uh, the impact of our current circumstances uh, on um, tenancy deposits in particular. Uh, I'm Alison McDougall. Uh, you can see I've got background in dispute resolution um, and I've been with TDS for uh, about 13 years now. And I'm currently uh, responsible for running the operational uh, side um, of our dispute resolution activities. So the things that we're going to be looking at um, today, obviously tenancy deposits and how we're managing uh, the situation around uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're going to give you some links to where you can find some information and guidance. But the main structure of the discussion today uh, has been um, set out in three main phases, uh, pre-tenancy questions, mid-tenancy questions, post-tenancy questions. And these are all based on um, questions that our customers have been raising with us over the past five or six weeks. Um, so you'll get uh, further information um, you'll see uh, on our special page on our website, which is our normal address with COVID-19 at the end. Uh, and we update that information regularly. So please keep an eye uh, on the information um, there uh, and we will keep it um, up to date with any further guidance that is being issued, um, particularly from MHCLG as we go through uh, the next couple of weeks. OK, so starting off um, first with the pre-tenancy um, set of questions. Um, the first question here, my tenants are about to move in, but I can't be there to do an accompanied check-in and inventory. Uh, so where do I stand? And obviously that um, is aimed at the situation where normally you would be either handing the tenant a copy of the inventory and the keys and giving them some guidance in your office, or perhaps you would normally uh, go to the property with the tenant, uh, actually check them in on the spot, go through the inventory with them, get their agreement to the inventory, have any discussions that you need to have. Uh, and they are virtually on day one, you would have an agreed schedule um, of condition of the property at the start of the tenancy. Obviously that situation uh, is now far from normal. Uh, so how would you cope with it? 
I think the important thing to remember here is that the tenant still needs to keep see uh, a copy of the inventory and schedule of condition. So either email that to the tenant or send it to the property address in advance of the start of the tenancy so that when the tenant moves in, they are in a position to go around the property themselves with the inventory uh, and raise any issues of concern that they have uh, about the condition of the property at the start of the tenancy. Uh, well, it's, it's to, um, hint is process. to ask the tenant to um, uh, comment uh, on the document within a set period of time and return it to you. Uh, so we suggest a good period of time of seven days for that to be reviewed and returned to you. Um, if at the end of the seven day period you haven't heard back from the tenant, uh, another really good thing would be to remind the tenant of the document uh, and that you are now expecting to have it returned to you. But, but if you don't get it back, um, again, to remind them in writing that the period for review uh, has now passed and you have assumed that they agree with the contents of the inventory uh, and that you can now rely on that as an agreed um, uh, schedule of the condition of the property at the start of the tenancy. As with all things, uh, actually even in a normal environment, but particularly at the moment, it's really important to keep a clear audit trail of what's happening. So if you're emailing things to the tenant, you will have a good audit trail there. If you're calling them or texting them, um, keep records of that. Uh, and if you're email, uh, sorry, if you're uh, posting things to the tenant, um, please keep a postal record as well. So that um, at the end of the tenancy, where hopefully conditions have returned to something more like normality, uh, we can all understand what happened um, in more difficult times. Okay, uh, sec uh, second question here, um, similar scenario in the sense that uh, you can't um, carry out things in the normal way. You've decided to hand over the keys to the property early um, before the tenancy starts. Uh, is that okay? Uh, again, important to keep an audit trail to demonstrate exactly what you're doing and why you're doing something out of the ordinary. So yes, uh, absolutely, um, get uh, the keys to the tenant in any way that is uh, practical for you to do so, uh, and obviously safe for you to do so, uh, and keep a record of what you've done. Uh, and obviously in that scenario, don't forget about the inventory as well. <clears throat> okay, um, third question uh, about the start of the tenancy. Uh, new tenants are due to move in soon. Uh, what happens if they have an interruption to their income bef uh, before the tenancy actually starts? What impact might that have on the deposit? Well, of course, you can make special arrangements with your tenant, particularly um, in the current circumstances. Uh, and our suggestion is that you might um, uh, agree, for example, that the deposit is not needed up front in the way that it would normally be. But obviously you will be expecting the uh, deposit to be paid at some point during the tenancy, either in one go uh, or in instalments. And whatever it is that you've agreed with your tenant, again, please commit that to writing. Don't forget, of course, that your legal obligations to protect the deposit and to uh, serve PI on the tenant still exist. Uh, so any amount that you are receiving needs to be um, protected uh, and PI served within 30 days uh, of receiving the deposit. Alison, are you able to hear me from your side? Um, I just wanted to interject just quickly and just welcome those people that have just joined. Um, uh, thank you to those people who have just been able to connect to the webinar. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to uh, say that if anybody wanted to ask any questions, they can do so uh, using the questions facility on the left-hand side, if you're on the computer, on a desktop computer, um, and it'll be located within your control panel uh, or your Zoho uh, Showtime account. Uh, if you click the questions button, which looks a bit like a speech mark uh, with a question mark through it, um, feel free to ask questions and Alison and I will, um, uh, towards the end of the webinar, uh, be happy to answer as many of those as we can. Alison, back over to you. Sorry, I just wanted to welcome those people that have just joined us. 
Okay, uh, thank you and uh, welcome for me as well. We've just covered um, three common questions um, from the start of the tenancy, um, but if you've missed any of that, um, if you follow uh, the links that are available, you will be able to find the full answers uh, on our website anyway. So moving on to the first of the mid-tenancy scenarios, um, this is around um, reducing uh, the tenant's rent on a temporary basis and um, will that still give you access to um, the deposit for rent arrears when the tenancy ends? Um, I think in, in the scenario where you're aiming only to reduce the uh, rent temporarily, um, then uh, you need to make that clear. So this is a, a situation where um, you are allowing the tenant to um, uh, fail to meet their full commitment for a period, but over the term of the tenancy, you would still expect the uh, full amount of rent to be paid. Uh, so first of all, again, audit trail and keep that very clear, both in your mind uh, and in the tenant's mind, that the full rent is still due um, uh, for, the, for the whole tenancy. So when you get to the end of the tenancy, if the tenant hasn't been able to make up uh, the rent shortfall during the remaining period of the tenancy, uh, then absolutely the deposit um, would be available as it would be in the normal way um, for uh, covering uh, shortfalls in rent uh, and or dilapidations. Uh, so there's nothing different in this scenario really from a normal rent arrears claim other than that you have agreed at some point in the tenancy um, for the uh, temporary reduction in the rent. And so in that scenario, again, just very important, uh, stress again, to keep a clear audit trail and to keep your um, rent statements up to date so that uh, the tenant understands what has happened and in the event that you would have to come um, to TDS for our adjudication service, that the adjudicator uh, is clear what the agreement was. Okay, the um, second question uh, is specifically around students, but actually it applies to um, all tenants. Uh, my tenant is a student and is leaving the property. Do they have to pay rent? Um, so uh, I think this has arisen as a specific question because there's been quite a lot of publicity around universities own accommodation and particular arrangements that they have made for um, students uh, and their ability to uh, leave the property at short notice potentially without a further commitment to rent. Uh, I mean, of course, your situations are different in the PRS. Uh, and uh, a student or any other tenant uh, is not permitted to stop paying rent um, unless the tenancy has come to an end or unless you have reached a specific agreement uh, with them. So unless you've agreed that rent uh, is no longer due or the tenancy uh, has ended early, um, then the rent is still due and the tenant still needs to be paying rent uh, until either the end of the fixed term or until they have given notice. So in that sense, uh, there is no particular distinction between the position of students and tenants in general. So it's up to you, of course, in these uh, current difficult situations, whether you want to bring the tenancy to an end early, if that's the situation, or whether in practical terms it would be too difficult um, to find a replacement tenant and you want to hold the tenant liable for rent until the end of the fixed term. Okay, um, uh, next question in the mid-tenancy um, part of the discussion. Uh, my tenant can't pay their rent and they want to use the deposit, uh, can they do so? Um, so uh, the uh, regulations around deposits make it quite clear that the deposit is a sum of money which is available um, to meet the tenant's obligations, but only at the end of the tenancy. So the deposit only comes into play in discussions between the landlord, the agent and the tenant once the tenancy has ended. So uh, if a tenant's approaching you um, midway through the tenancy and saying, well, I can't pay the rent this month, why don't you just use the deposit? You need to have a discussion with them uh, that makes it clear to them that that's not possible at that point in time 
uh, of course, the deposit will be accessible in the normal way at the end of the tenancy. Um, but, uh, you know, be, be practical about the situation, um, because obviously if you're going to uh, potentially use the deposit at the end of the tenancy for unpaid rent, uh, then you may find yourself in the situation where the unpaid rent is using up the whole deposit and that's not giving you any flexibility uh, around any potential dilapidations issues. OK, uh, moving on to the end of tenancy um, scenarios now. Um, first scenario, a concern on the part of the agent of the landlord that the tenant um, had COVID-19 before they moved out. Uh, and um, there is an understandable um, reluctance to enter the property at the time that you would normally do, which is immediately at the end of the tenancy to conduct the checkout. Um, what's the best approach in this scenario? Uh, well, when the um, lockdown first started, um, we were suggesting that you tried to uh, get your checkout completed within a maximum of four weeks from the tenancy uh, end date. Uh, as time marches on and the lockdown continues, uh, in practical terms, you may find it difficult to meet the, the four weeks. But, but uh, I think the main message is as soon as it is safe and practical for you to access the property to complete the checkout, then that's at the point at which you uh, need to be thinking of doing it. I think it's very important, though, to keep the tenant advised of what's going on um, in the sense that they uh, may be expecting the deposit um, process to take place as normal. Uh, and obviously, if you feel you're in a situation where you can't conduct the checkout, uh, immediately or in the relatively short term, then you need to keep the tenant um, up to date with that. Uh, as far as TDS is concerned, uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, we're obviously aware that there is going to be an issue with a number of checkouts being completed well after the normal time frame. And the normal time frame we would expect is that a checkout would be conducted within a couple of days of the end of the tenancy. And, and so that very clearly um, sets in stone the um, condition of the property at that point. Um, however, it is likely over the course of time that we may have to deal with uh, a number of uh, documents which look um, out of date in that respect. Uh, again, if you're needing to come to us to access our ADR services, with um, checkout reports that look out of date, please um, clearly explain to us why that has happened. And we will take a pragmatic approach. You know, we will look at the documentation uh, and on a case by case basis decide in this particular scenario, is the passage of time likely to have made a material difference or not? Uh, we haven't come across a case like that yet, um, but we will, I assure you, be looking at them as pragmatically as we can. OK, next question on the end of the tenancy. Uh, what should I do if I can't get estimates for work uh, needed on the property because you can't get the um, contractor to go round and have a look at the problem and give you a quote? Um, the first thing I should say here is that although we always find invoices and estimates and quotations useful, and I don't want in any sense to suggest that you shouldn't be trying to get them, they are not uh, necessary uh, in terms of the adjudicator making a decision um, at the end of the tenancy on any dispute that you send us. So the adjudicators have long experience in, in knowing in, uh, uh, in a range of scenarios uh, what a reasonable cost for work uh, might be. And of course, the adjudicator also has to take into account factors such as betterment, uh, and fair wear and tear. So the actual invoice, if you had it, or the estimate of the quote, is not necessarily um, a sum of money that the adjudicator will feel bound to in an adjudication scenario anyway, because there will be other factors that they would have to take into account. However, uh, in a practical sense, if you can get hold of contractors who are willing to work with photographs or your um, description of the scenario as you found it, 
then you know please try to get um, estimates on a best efforts basis because they you know they genuinely do have value um, but don't get um, too concerned if you haven't been able to do that. I think the, the real message about all of this end of tenancy process uh, is to really to keep communication open with your tenant. Uh, so you're having difficulties with things like that. You know, it's equally important that the um, uh, tenant understands what your difficulties are uh, and that you have a reasonable discussion uh, about the issues between you and try to settle that as quickly as possible. And finally, I think on the end of um, tenancy uh, issues, uh, my tenancy is about to end, but I'm self isolating, so cannot go to the property to do a checkout. What should I do? So this is perhaps a scenario where the tenant is likely still to be in the property, but you understandably can't get the prop to the property to conduct the checkout in the normal way. Um, so this is our opportunity. Um, as hopefully we're being today, to be creative um, with uh, readily available tools. So if your tenant has access to an iPad or um, video on their phone uh, and you can uh, arrange with them to do a tour of the property where they are showing you um, in broad terms what the property looks like and you can maybe ask some questions. Can you open the fridge? Can you show me what the oven looks like? Um, can you uh, show me around the bathroom, the, the bath seal, etc. All the all the issues that you um, you know normally expect to check at the end of the tenancy, and the tenant is able to facilitate that. Then, although it's not perfect, although it's not a direct substitute for doing the checkout, you may be able to derive enough um, comfort from that to have a discussion with the tenant either to say that you're um, uh, happy with uh, how the uh, property appears to have been left and that you can arrange to release the deposit to them, or if there are things that you're concerned about um, to discuss with the tenant at that point, what you're concerned about and what arrangement between you, you might be able to make to uh, rectify the situation. Um, if uh, you can't do that on the day with the tenant, uh, perhaps the tenant can do a video themselves and upload it um, or send it to you, uh, or perhaps in a relatively old fashioned way, the tenant can take a number um, of uh, still images and send them on to you. Uh, so um, uh, actually at the end of the call in the, in the um, uh, question and answer session, if anyone has come uh, uh, come up with um, uh, good alternatives, then please um, feel free to share that with the rest of the audience. Okay, um, that's the uh, end of the formal bit of my presentation. Um, hope you found that helpful. Uh, before I hand back over to Ben uh, and um, the Q&A session, we're just going to ask you to take part in a quick snap poll, so a question will be coming up uh, right now for you. Uh, and I'll leave that running for a little bit to let that be answered and then I'll publish the results. Uh, and after that, um, Ben will take over uh, and uh, bring you to the conclusion of the session after the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alison. That was really informative and I hope that gave agents a really good update. Um, on how they should approach uh, such a challenging time uh, as COVID-19. be interesting to see the results of this snap poll and see what everybody believes. Um, so the question for those who can or cannot see it, uh, have your tenants requested a reduction in rent due to COVID-19? So the votes are ticking up now. Uh, I'll just let it run for a small amount longer. People still voting, thank you very much. Looks like we have a bit of a landslide on this. <laughs> we do. Okay, I'm going to publish the results and then we'll move on to the Q&A. Super. Thank you for that, Alison. Uh, if we could just move on one slide, that'd be great. 
So um, this is an opportunity for uh, everybody to uh, ask questions. Um, I have picked uh, six questions, Alison, uh, to run through, if that's OK, uh, from the audience so far. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you, which has been asked uh, by Joseph. Uh, Joseph asks, are documents signed via DocuSign and other such services sufficient? Um, so the answer to that is the scenario here is um, no different in the current um, lockdown to uh, the normal scenario. So I, I think these days it's probably relatively common for um, agents to be using um, DocuSign for things like your PI, for example, and perhaps your tenancy agreement. So there is no difference in, in a legal sense between what we're facing now with documentation and what we would normally do. So if your normal practice, in other words, is to use DocuSign, um, then uh, that seems sensible to continue with that, particularly at the moment. Super. Um, Okie dokie. Now, um, just to say to anyone, if for any reason they're experiencing any te technical difficulties at all, um, sometimes refreshing the page to reset the browser does help. So if you are experiencing any technical issues between Alison and I, or you can hear one of us or not both of us, for example, please do try and refresh the page. This might help. Um, let's move on to question two now, which is from Lisa. Um, a tenant has painted three or four, three or four of the walls and then realized it was a different color. Then lockdown happened and she said that the DIY stores were closed so she wouldn't be able to buy any more paint. Would TDA, TDS allow this as a fair excuse for not completing this? Um, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I think b and is now open, but it's probably too late. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, TDS and all of the adjudicators, you know, truly recognise that we are dealing with very unusual circumstances. And I think that the message for all these odd scenarios uh, that you're all facing is just to explain clearly to us what has happened. So in this scenario, the tenants done their best, but they haven't been able to complete the work. And so the adjudicator would look in the normal way to see what the condition of the property and the walls was at the start of the tenancy. They'll look to see whether they had uh, the tenant had your agreement or not to um, repaint the walls. If the tenant was trying the best to um, restore the condition of the walls at the end of the tenancy, but only got three quarters of the way round the problem, if I can put it that way, uh, but they've, you know, done a reasonable job on what they've done, but there is a bit more to be done. And the comparison of the start and the end of the tenancy in the usual way um, justifies uh, an award being made. Then, um, you know, there, there is no reason in that scenario, as long as the evidence stacks up that um, an award um, to complete the work, taking into account fair wear and tear, betterment and all the usual factors would not be um, uh, you know, considered by the adjudicator. I, you know, this is not a sort of excuses situation. This is the adjudicator looking at all of the evidence in the round, deciding whether the landlord has suffered a loss uh, and in the normal way, trying to come up with an award uh, from the deposit, which recognises the true extent of that loss. Super. Thank you for clearing that up, Alison. That's, that's a really interesting one. Um, we've had another really good question in from Magda, who asks, are agents at risk by asking inv uh, inventory clerks to carry out inventory checkouts as they aren't deemed as essential workers? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, the whole issue around um, checkouts, Magda, is, is quite um, a difficult one. Uh, I think, um, you know, we can all look at the guidance and um, pick through uh, our own interpretations of it. But I think we would probably, irrespective of the guidance, all take the view um, that we have to exercise um, personal and professional caution around accessing properties at the moment. So, you know, even if um, an inventory clerk or the agent themselves um, is happy um, that they uh, are willing to access the property, then um, you know, we should be allowing a passage of time to elapse um, following the tenant's departure um, for any um, potential contamination on surfaces, for example, 
um, to have disappeared. But, you know, you'll all be dealing with your own health and safety advice. Um, infantry clerks um, will have um, the same a scenario where they will be guided by um, whatever their employer is asking them to do. So uh, again, you just have to work with what uh, what you have and to try and get reasonable access to the property as soon as you are comfortable and feel safe to do so. Thank you for that. That's uh, that's perfect. Hopefully that answers Magda's question. Moving on now, a question from Julia who asks. When taking the deposit in instalments, do we need to protect each part or wait until we get it all? Um, so the answer to that is you do need to protect each part unless for some reason you expected to receive more than one part within 30 days, if you see what I mean. So the requirement is to um, protect within 30 days of receipt. Um, if you were expecting to receive it in four weekly installments, you might want me um, to let, you know, two or three installments run and then protect that lot if you wanted to. Uh, or you might just protect uh, each part individually um, if you were um, perhaps more realistically expecting to receive the installments over a period of more than 30 days. Super. Thank you for that. Um, Next question from Christine, who asks, can you uh, uh, can you ask outgoing tenants to do a video of the room property as a move out check? Um, yes, you can. And if tenants are able to do that, and particularly if you are able to take part in that with them, um, I think that is the ideal or the best scenario that we can all hope for at the moment. So ideally, you could ask the tenant to do a walk round that you participated in remotely. Um, and, uh, you know, in that sense, you could then guide the tenant uh, to various areas of the property that you might um, be concerned about because, you know, you always have to check the fridge, you always have to check the oven, you know, um, you're, you're always um, checking various areas of the property as a matter of course. Um, so, please uh, try and encourage tenants to make use of that type of facility and please try and join in if you possibly can. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, next question um, from Yugesh who asks, foreign students have terminated a fixed term agreement with Midway and have stopped paying the rent and left the country. Can I access the deposit for the rent due before the end of the fixed term agreement? OK, so um, this is clearly a fixed term scenario. So, you, you know, tenants obviously cannot unilaterally um, terminate a tenancy unless there's a break clause during the fixed term. Um, so uh, the only way you could consider that tenancy to be an end at an end at the moment is if you agree that it is at an end. Otherwise, it is a continuing tenancy with a continuing obligation um, on the tenant um, to pay rent. However, if in practical terms, you realize that the tenants have um, gone back to their home country, they are perhaps unlikely to reappear um, uh, either indefinitely or until they start the next academic year, for example, um, then you might want to regard the um, tenancy as at an end now. And if you do accept that it's at an end now and there is rent outstanding, um, then uh, because the tenancy is at an end that you will be able to access the deposit. If, on the other hand, at the point that the tenants left the property, the rent was up to date, our suggestion would be uh, obviously, you make your best efforts to find uh, replacement tenants that you write to the departed tenants and say the fixed term is still running. You're looking for uh, new tenants. Uh, and as soon as you find them, uh, you uh, will conclude a new tenancy agreement and the departing tenants tenancy will be at an end. But in the meantime, they remain liable for rent until the end of the fixed term. Um, during that scenario, while you're looking for new tenants, and obviously that itself is a difficult process at the moment, 
um, then uh, rent, if rent will continue to be due, and if the tenants are not paying that rent, um, then at any point in that cycle, particularly when you recognise that the deposit would have been fully utilised by outstanding rent, you can make the decision that the, uh, the tenancy is an, at an end at that point, and at that point you can access the deposit. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, a couple more. I'm just going to pick a couple more. Thank you to everybody that's asked um, uh, questions that we've received and we've been inundated. So thank you so much. Um, next question comes from Ryan, who asks, a tenant has moved out just before lockdown. The agent checked the property and gave the tenant their full deposit back. However, there is a fridge, a cooker and other items that have been left in the back garden. Is the ag agent responsible for paying for clearance? Um, well, uh, uh, there's there's two separate issues here, who's responsible and the fact that the deposit has already been given back. So you have already given the deposit back. So in the sense, um, uh, the, the deposit is no longer available to meet any obligations um, that the tenant may have had. Uh, it doesn't mean, of course, that you can't still ask the tenant um, to pay for the removal of the items. So, you know, you can have a separate discussion with tenants um, outside uh, the confines of the deposit to see if the tenant is willing to meet um, the removal costs uh, or at least partially meet the removal costs. Um, but that is, you know, a difficult discussion that you will have to have given that the deposit has already been released. Um, uh, you, you know, you may want to consider whether the, uh, you know, tenants uh, leave items in property for a variety of reasons. They either leave them there because they don't want to pay the cost of moving them, or they leave them there genuinely because they think they will be of use to subsequent tenants. Um, if you um, regard them as useful uh, and the tenant has effectively abandoned them, then you may want to keep them. But my, my first suggestion would be uh, engage with the tenant to see whether they are willing to um, meet the costs, uh, irrespective of the deposit. Um, uh, if not, um, check what the items are and their usefulness to the landlord going forward. Um, but ultimately, uh, I guess if you reach a dead end on that, then um, the, the landlord or the agent would have to be responsible for removing the items from the property. Super, thank you for clearing that up. The final question we're going to come to, which comes from Philip, who asks, are non-essential tenants allowed to move in during lockdown? Um, I mean, I, th I think, uh, generally speaking, our understanding is that there is not much going on in terms of um, uh, new tenancies commencing. Um, but uh, everything that is around uh, these sort of issues is, is highly advisory, I guess, is, is the best way to put it. Um, I, I'm not aware that there is there are any particular checks going on to say that um, you know, you can only access this property because you have a um, key frontline worker accreditation. So I'm sure there are scenarios where tenancies uh, are still commencing and tenants are still moving into, into properties. Um, but obviously, you know, it's something that tenants will want to discuss with you. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on their particular circumstances, have they, you know, access to any other accommodation, for example, um, uh, then, uh, it, you know, it, it may be uh, impractical to allow the tenancy to, to take place in as normal circumstances as you can do. Alison, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for, for taking those questions and thank you to everybody who participated and did uh, ask a question uh, during that session. I think it was extremely useful for many people uh, to understand what's going on and, and from TDS's perspective, uh, how you might approach it. Um, if we could just move on to the uh, next slide now, Alison, we, we're going to go to uh, an end of the question session and just give everybody a little bit of an update where they can receive further information on COVID-19. Uh, there's two sources where uh, you'd be able to do this. You can do so on the Tenancy Deposit Schemes website on the dedicated COVID-19 FAQs page. Uh, the, the link is on the uh, uh, screen there on the slides, but I'll read it out for everyone, 
tenancydepositscheme.com forward slash COVID hyphen 19 forward slash. Um, there's questions on there and these are being updated as soon as we get more questions um, as much as we can. And the second place where you can find uh, government related information is on the government website www.gov.uk forward slash coronavirus. Um, let's just move on one step. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody for their time today. Uh, thank Alison for uh, doing a splendid job at presenting uh, the different questions that TDS has encountered um, over the last uh, challenging and, and uh, difficult period of time for many. So thank you to everyone for taking the time to um, watch today. Uh, the webinar recording will be made available um, as soon as it, we can do so. We'll upload uh, it to the website um, and we'll also email you where possible. Um, and thank you again to everybody. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you onto a TDS webinar very soon and wishing you a uh, fantastic end of the day. Alison, thank you once again. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks and bye bye.